All right, turn with me this morning to John chapter 10. As young people are dismissed to their time, turn with me to John chapter 10. Giving you a lot of announcements this morning. Appreciate your patience with all those. We just like to keep you informed um, of everything that's going on. Bear with me. Let me make one more while I prayed uh, this morning. Thank God for the work of our church and the community and the way he's using it to get the name of the church out. And the reason we get the name of the church out is we want to preach the gospel to everybody. We want them to know we're here. Uh, one of the ways we do that is, is we sponsor ministries in town like Carolina Pregnancy Center, Child Evangelism Fellowship. Another thing we do is uh, we recently sponsored the Boosterthon Fun Run at Roebuck Elementary School. And the net result of that is when these children did their run, they were given a T-shirt to mark their laps on. And on that T-shirt, we had the name of our church. So it's right there on the back here towards the bottom, Roebuck Presbyterian Church. About 850 of these went out, and those children are wearing those shirts uh, in their homes, and that gets the name of the church out there. So again, we just thank you for your charity towards the ministry here. Seek to use those funds, again, to, to make known the work of the church to preach the gospel to our community, and to continue to let people know about Jesus. So to that end, we are here today in John chapter 10, and I'm going to read verses 7 through 18. Now let us hear the word of the Lord. Therefore Jesus said again, Very truly I tell you, I am the gate for the sheep. All who have come before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep have not listened to them. I am the gate. Whoever enters through me will be saved. They will come in and go out and find pasture. The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I have come that they may have life and have it to the full. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. The hired hand is not the shepherd and does not own the sheep. So when he sees the wolf coming, he abandons the sheep and runs away. Then the wolf attacks the flock and scatters it. The man runs away because he is a hired hand and cares nothing for the sheep. I am the good shepherd. I know my sheep, and my sheep know me, just as the Father knows me, and I know the Father, and I lay down my life for the sheep. I have other sheep that are not of this sheep pen. I must bring them also. They too will listen to my voice, and there shall be one flock and one shepherd. The reason my Father loves me is that I lay down my life only to take it up again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down of my own accord. I have authority to lay it down and authority to take it up again. This command I received from my Father. Amen. This is God's word. And we're coming today to the third of the five points of Calvinism that we've been studying recently together On Sunday morning, today we look at the L, known as limited atonement. I want to say two things about this at the very front. One, of all the five points of Calvinism, this is probably the most disputed. Even people who accept the other five points will sometimes not hold to this one. They're not convinced 100% that it is scriptural, that they might say limited atonement, it's just a logical implication of the other four points of Calvinism, but it's not directly taught by the Word of God. And you may hear phrases like four-point Calvinists when referring to this situation. So my point there is that even people who are friendly to Calvinism may come to this one and say, I don't know if I buy that. I don't know if I see that in the scripture. And, and I say that because it's okay. It takes a little while sometimes to process this one. Here's why I think, though, it's okay to give you a little space there. After studying for this message, I've never been more convinced than I am now that this is a scriptural doctrine. And I know it can take time, and I know it can, it can be a lot to swallow, but I think it is solidly taught from God's word. I think you can demonstrate this doctrine right from the pages of scripture. It's not just logic. It is what scripture teaches. And it's what scripture teaches not by ignoring or or minimizing other texts. Well, there's some 
verses out there that make us uncomfortable, so, so we'll just ignore those? No, I think when we embrace this doctrine, you'll see that it's woven throughout the entire Bible. And here's the second thing, then, that I will say up front. Well, I do believe that this is a scriptural doctrine. I don't like the title, Limited Atonement, very much. It fits the acronym, TULIP, but I don't think it's a good way to describe this doctrine. And here's why. I think when you say limited atonement, it just puts the focus in the wrong place. It's a phrase that kind of puts you on the defensive from the very beginning. Because if you start talking about the atonement, and, and, and you lead by saying, all right, I don't think Jesus died for every individual, then people are going to say, well, then why does the Bible say things like, God so loves the world, and that Jesus died for all, and that he wants all people to be saved? And there are references we could turn to that use that very language in Holy Scripture. Those are good questions, and, and we hope to answer some of those questions. But I don't think you start the conversation by trying to answer those questions. Instead, you should start by asking this. What was the divine design behind the atonement? In other words, ask yourself, what did God intend to accomplish when he gave Jesus on the cross for us. And furthermore, was he successful? Did the atonement do what it was intended to do? And if you start the conversation there, and if we get the answers to those questions right, then I'll think we'll understand what those other verses are truly saying. So here's what I'm going to argue today. Christ died to guarantee salvation. For the elect, those whom God has chosen, Christ's death secures their salvation. It not only makes their salvation possible, or we should even say it does not make their salvation possible, it makes their salvation certain. The death of Christ accomplishes God's purpose to save. And here's how we're going to show that. We're going to look at three passages. And all of them, though, are in John. And we're not going to go through them in great detail. We're just going to read through them and highlight the main ideas and show how they contribute to this doctrine of limited atonement, or perhaps the better language is particular redemption. All right, let's do that. For the first passage, I want you to turn just a few pages back to John chapter 6. We're going to look at verses 37 through 39. John 6, verses 37 through 39. Like I said, three passages. As we read each one, I want you to be on the alert for three things. And it's going to be the same three in every passage. So I'm going to say these three several times. So if you don't get it the first time, that's fine. Here's the three things I want you to keep your eyes peeled for. One, I want you to look for verses that refer to the Father giving a people to the Son. Because when you read that language, you are reading about election. Secondly, I want you to look for verses that refer to people coming to Christ, to people believing in Christ, to people being saved, to people obtaining eternal life. We call that calling and preservation. The Spirit calls people to believe in Jesus, and the Spirit preserves them to the last day. I want you to be on the lookout for those verses. And then thirdly, I want you to look for verses that focus on the work of Christ. What Christ does to accomplish salvation. And here's why. Here's what you're going to see. Time and time again, in all three of these passages, the work of Christ is grounded in the Father's choice and guarantees the Spirit's call. Those three things that I mentioned, the work of Christ is right in the middle. It's grounded in what the Father has chosen, and it guarantees 
what the Spirit will do. What Jesus does is for those whom the Father has given to him and always results in their salvation. And that's why we say then that the work of Christ guarantees the salvation of God's elect. Let's just look at the verses together. Let's begin right with verse 37, John chapter 6. Jesus says, all those the Father gives me will come to me. Now, right off the bat, there's two of the things we're looking for. Jesus refers back to election. All those the Father gives me. He looks ahead to their successful calling. They will come to me. And notice it is the same group of people who experience both. All those the Father gives me will come to me. Look at verse 38. Now we introduce the work of Christ into the equation. For I have come down from heaven, not to do my own will, but to do the will of him who sent me. Now this is huge. Christ is saying, I have not come to do anything in salvation other than what the Father purposed me to do. Sometimes you hear this verse quoted by saying, look, Jesus always did the will of the Father. We should do the will of the Father. It's more specific than that. Jesus is saying in salvation, I have come to do what the Father told me to do. Well, what has the Father told him to do? Look at verse 39. And this is the will of him who sent me, that I shall lose none of all those he has given me, but raise them up on the last day. And by the way, there's all three ideas that we're looking for. The Father has given a people to the Son. The Son comes to save them. And this guarantees that on the last day, they will be raised up. What is Jesus saying? What I have come to do is for those the Father has given me and guarantees that they will be saved. And if you look at verse 38, because you're wondering, okay, but where does it say that he dies for them? Well, look at verse 38. I have come down from heaven. This is Jesus talking about his entire saving mission. He becomes a man. He lives an obedient life. He dies on the cross. He is raised from the dead. He ascends back into heaven. Jesus says, why did I come to do all those things? Because the Father sent me to accomplish the salvation of those that he has given me. His work, his ministry guarantees the salvation of that people from the Father. Let's look at the second passage. You can go back to John 10. Some of the verses that we read only a moment ago. I'm just going to highlight here the three main ideas that we are looking for. First, where do we have a reference to the Father choosing? Look towards the end of the chapter. Verse 29. Here Jesus is talking about his sheep. He says in verse 27, my sheep listen to my voice. Now in verse 29, he says, my Father who has given them to me is greater than all. No one can snatch them out Of my father's hand. See that same language we just saw in John 6? Jesus uses it again in John 10. He refers to his sheep as those whom the father has given to him. Look also at verse 26. Jesus says to the Pharisees, But you do not believe because you are not of my sheep. Now, notice how that verse is phrased. Jesus does not say, you are not of my sheep because you don't believe. No, he says, you do not believe because you are not of my sheep. What's he implying? That if the Pharisees were his sheep, then they would listen to him and follow him. And you might be tempted when you read that to say, okay, okay, but he's talking about those who already believe. They believe. And they become sheep, and so they continue to believe. But Jesus never says that. In fact, he says that the elect are his sheep before they actually believe. Look for a moment at verse 16. Jesus says, I have other sheep 
that are not of this sheep pen. I must bring them also. They too will listen to my voice. And there shall be one flock and one shepherd. Jesus is talking here about Gentile Christians. Sometimes some have tried to take this text to refer to non-Christian people who end up in heaven in the end. No, Jesus is doing language that Israelites would understand. We are the flock of God. Well, what is Jesus saying? I've got other sheep outside of this flock. Gentiles who I am going to bring into this flock. I will call them eventually and they will join the flock. They will experience salvation. They haven't experienced it yet. But notice Jesus says they are already my sheep. And because they are my sheep, this guarantees that in time I will call them and they will join the flock. I will be their shepherd. Well, when did they become his sheep? Verse 29, when the father gave them to the son. Now, don't be don't be tripped up by that. Don't be confused by that. I am not saying that the elect are saved before they believe. You have to believe in Christ in order to be saved. You must actually at some point join the flock by putting your trust in Jesus Christ. But here's what I am saying. Because the father gave you to the son, Before he made the world, you are already, before you believe, in some sense, his sheep, previously marked for salvation. So that leads now to the second thing then. What does Jesus do to accomplish their salvation? The father gives the sheep to the son. What does the son do to secure their salvation? For whom does the son die? Look at verse 11. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. End of verse 15, Jesus says it again. I lay down my life for the sheep. Who does Jesus? Jesus dies for the sheep. They're the ones whom the Father has given him. They are the ones whom the Father has authorized him to die for. And you say, well, yes, he dies for the sheep, but that doesn't mean he doesn't die for the non-sheep. But look at verses 17 and 18. Jesus has no authority to do anything other than what the Father told him to do. Look at verse 17. The reason my Father loves me is that I lay down my life only to take it up again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down of my own accord. I have authority to lay it down and authority to take it up again. This command I received from my Father. Jesus' death is not detached in any way from what the Father has told him to do for the people the Father has given to him. He said in John 6, I came to do the will of my Father, which is raise up, save all those whom the Father has given me. And now he says, I have authority from the Father to lay down my life and to take it up again. His death is authorized by the Father to buy the sheep. That is whom Jesus dies for. So what is the result then of this? The third idea, what happens To the sheep, again, verse 16, Jesus has other sheep that he must bring who will listen to his voice and join the flock. And finally, verses 27 and 28, my sheep listen to my voice. I know them and they follow me. I give them eternal life and they shall never perish. No one will snatch them out of my hand. Choosing leads to atonement, which leads to salvation forever. Last passage, and we'll look at this one quickly. John 17. John chapter 17. Jesus again makes these same points in his high priestly prayer. John 17 is one of the richest, deepest passages in all of Scripture. Let's just look at a few verses in it. To make this point one more time. Again, the first thing we see is we have reference to the Father giving a people to the Son. Look at verse 2. For you granted him authority over all people that he might give eternal life to all those you have given him. Verse 6. I have revealed you to those whom you gave me out of the world. They were yours. You gave them to me. And they have obeyed your word. There's all three ideas tied together 
in verse 6. And sometimes people come to the chapter and say, yeah, but that's just talking about the disciples there. But no, look at verse 20. My prayer is not for them alone. I pray also for those who will believe in me through their message. Everything that Jesus prays here is for the present believers at that time and the future believers, which includes you and me. The Father gave us to the Son. So what does Jesus do to secure our salvation? Again, verse 2. For you granted him, the Son, authority over all people that he might give eternal life to all those you have given him. Universal sovereignty given to the Son so that he can save those whom the Father has given to him. Skip down to verse 4. I have brought you glory on earth by finishing the work you gave me to do. He's about to go to the cross. He hasn't gone to the cross yet, but notice Jesus can say from his perspective, the work is already accomplished. He has lived and died for his people in order to give them eternal life. And so the very last thing that he does, the very last thing before going to the cross is he prays for them. Verse 9, he says, I pray for them. I am not praying for the world but for those you have given me, for they are yours. What is the focus of Jesus' work as our high priest? It is the salvation of his people. And I know he's only talking about prayer here, but prayer is tied to atonement. They're two parts of one work. They always have the same object. They always have the same goal. They always have the same people. They always have the same result the salvation of God's elect. Jesus dies for them and prays for them, and in time they come to him. Two cross-references. Bear with me, but these are good. Isaiah 53, this ties death and prayer together. Isaiah 53, By his knowledge my righteous servant will justify many, and he will bear their iniquities. For he bore the sin of many and made intercession for the transgressors. Romans 8.34, who then is the one who condemns? No one. Christ Jesus, who died more than that, who is raised to life, is at the right hand of God and is also interceding for us. You see how they're tied together? You can't cut them apart. He died. He rose again. He intercedes for his people. What is the result? These are the last two verses we'll read. Verse 6, I have revealed you to those whom you gave me out of the world. They were yours. You gave them to me, and they have obeyed your word. Verse 8, for I gave them the words you gave me, and they accepted them. They knew with certainty that I came from you, and they believed that you sent me. I think when, when you take these three passages, when you take these three ideas, when you tie them all together, I think they demonstrate that the work of Christ is for those whom the Father has given to him, and it has secured their salvation. Christ's death guarantees salvation. Now, that leaves us with with this question then. If this is true, if the death of Christ is particular, if it accomplishes the goal of salvation, why then do the scriptures use this kind of universal language to describe the death of Christ. Why does a John 3.16 say, for God so loved the world? Well, I want to be crystal clear that limited atonement is not disputing God's love for sinful human beings. We just don't think it's wise to always read the word world in the sense of every person who has ever lived or ever will live. Think for a minute how John also uses the word world. 1 John 2.15, he says, Do not love the world or anything in the world. Now, John there is talking about the evil world system, the, the alliance of the ungodly who rebel against God, who are in opposition to God. And John warns us, don't follow that system. It leads you away from God. What does John 3.16 say then? It highlights the fact that people trapped in that system, God loves them. And he has acted to save them. 
It's not saying how extensive is God's love. Oh, look how far it goes. It's saying, look how deep God's love is. It loves even the world. What kind of people does God love? He loves wicked people. People who need salvation and he has given the son to save them. That is the message of John 3.16. And it's helpful to realize that the scriptures often use the word world in a general sense. It's not always meant exhaustively. Luke 2.1, well-known Christmas verse. In the days of Caesar Augustus, a decree went out that all the world should be taxed. But I can assure you that decree did not go to Peru. It went to the inhabited Roman world. John 12, 19. I know I said a minute ago I was reading my last verses. I was lying. I'm sorry. John 12, 19. Jesus, uh, commenting on his ministry, says to the Pharisees, no, the Pharisees say to one another, look how the whole world has gone after him. They're using the word world there to refer to a very small number of people. The inhabitants of Jerusalem who were following Jesus. World does not always mean every person. It rarely means that, in fact, in the scriptures. And you could say the same thing about the word all. It's a general term. It's not exhaustive. It often means all kinds. And as part of the notes that I put on the back counter, I've got all these listed out. We'll talk about these Wednesday night. We're not trying to avoid these. We just can't go through them all one by one at this moment. Why, though, does God use this kind of language? If it's not exhaustive, why does God speak of the atonement sometimes in general terms? Here's why. Because he's commissioned us to go into the whole world, to preach the gospel to every creature. And through that general call, by offering the gospel to every person, God will save his elect. That is how he accomplishes his purpose in salvation by sending us out generally to call all men to salvation promising that through that call he will save his people and i'm telling you this has inspired countless missionaries and ministers throughout the history of christianity notable figures such as john calvin david brainerd jonathan edwards george whitfield william Tennant, samuel davies william carey david livingston adoniram judson john stott francis schaefer d james kennedy and john piper these are well-known people who are all calvinists and have been inspired by god's truth and atonement to go out and preach the gospel they knew this that christ had purchased from every tribe and language, and people, and nation, a people for himself. That's Revelation 5, 9. There's the world. Through the preaching of the word, all kinds of people come to salvation. Here's where I want to leave you this morning. I don't want to leave you merely with the idea that, look, this is the truth, this is what the scriptures teach. We believe that, we confess that. But I don't just want to leave it at this. All right, it's a theological idea. This is a Presbyterian church. We have to talk about this. No, no, no. I want to do more than that. I want you to see this is a truth that will ground you in your walk with God. This is not just theology that we do because it's what we have to do. This impacts how you live. This impacts how you know God. Why? How so? Here's what I'll say, and we're close. We talk about atonement. Because we're in the wrong. We have sinned against God. We need salvation. And we are all predisposed to do something to fix this mess ourselves. Whether it's the world's ideas, look like this, drive a car like this, dress like this, act like this. Or whether it's some moral system you set up, we all want to do something to be accepted. We all want to do something to fit in. And with reference to God, we all want to do something to feel like, okay, everything's right between me and God. You know what limited atonement teaches you? An unconditional election and irresistible grace. It teaches you that God has done it all. Jesus paid it all. Did I believe enough? Was I sincere? Did I say the right things? Will I really make it to the end? Or will I give up the faith one day? God loves you too much to put the ball entirely in your hands. He loves you too much to let any part of your salvation rest with you. Yes, you believe. Yes, you persevere. 
But the very fact that you want to do those things and the very fact that you can do those things is because God chose you and sent Jesus to die for you and has given the Spirit to you to enable you. He did not die to make your salvation possible. He died to save you from your sins. Claire Davis says this, Jesus didn't die to open the door. He didn't die to give you some help. He didn't die to stir you up to make something of yourself. He did a lot more than that. He saved you from your sins. He set you free from your foolish unbelief so that now you see him in his glory. Christ died to save us from sin. Let's pray together. Father in heaven, we are so thankful for your mercies this morning. We are so thankful for your grace. Father, we thank you for your patience with us that when we were dead in our trespasses and sins, you raised us up to new life. That when we were without strength, why we were still ungodly, Christ died for us. Father, I pray that this morning this truth would warm our hearts. Father, give us understanding of what the scriptures teach. Give us Give us that sense of your patience, Lord, that that you are so patient and kind with us as we we wrestle with the word and and try to believe and and say and do the right things. Lord, give us wisdom. Help us to understand these things. Help us to grapple with them and and to come away with, with with assurance of your truth. Father, I also pray that you would just ground us in the fact that you have done everything that needs to be done to save us from our sins. I pray that as we leave this morning, you would give us an assurance of that salvation, that we would go out rejoicing in, in, a, in a Savior who has saved us from our sins, not, not rejoicing in any particular system, not, not giving any glory to man, but rejoicing in truth and rejoicing in the Savior. And Father, may you inspire us to then live for you, to spread the fame of your name and to enjoy you forever because of what you have done for us through Christ on the cross. Thank you for being a sufficient Savior. Thank you for your mercies. Build us up in truth. Bring us in more and more unity around the gospel. Give us more and more assurance of your love for us. We pray in Jesus' name, amen.